Thank you very much, and thanks, Tim, for uh, having all of us here today, and to the to the Internet Caucus for hosting this event, and, and all of the sponsors. Um, as Tim mentioned, I'm Nancy Libin. I'm a partner at Wilkinson Barker and Hour, where I lead the privacy practice. And before that, I was the chief privacy officer at the Department of Justice. And on our panel today, from left to right, uh, we've got Brian Chase, who is the general counsel of Foursquare, which is one of the leading location-based social network services. Stephanie Pell, who's the founder of SKP, sorry, SKP Strategies, which provides legislative and policy counsel on these and other issues. She's also a former counsel on the House Judiciary Committee and a former federal prosecutor uh, in several capacities at DOJ. And at the end of the table, Jason Weinstein, who is a partner at Steptoe, but was formerly a federal prosecutor and deputy assistant attorney general in the criminal division at DOJ. Uh, so it's a great panel with a, a wide range of viewpoints. Um, before we get started, and I know each of the panelists will give a brief opening statement and then we'll move to questions, I just wanted to tee up the issue a bit for the discussion. And I know that last year at State of the Mobile Net, you all had a lively discussion about the Supreme Court's then recent decision in Jones, where the court reached a unanimous decision that law enforcement's installation of a tracking device on a suspect's vehicle and the subsequent prolonged tracking of that suspect uh, was a search under the Fourth Amendment. And without getting into the decision, because I know that's been discussed, um, as you may recall, although the court reached a unanimous decision, there were three separate opinions in that case. Scalia, Justice Scalia, wrote the majority opinion, but Justices Sotomayor and Alito wrote concurring opinions. And Justices Alito and Sotomayor discussed or alluded to the ways that location information is generated and used today uh, to provide services to consumers and how the rapid pace of technological change uh, might outpace our ability to understand its impact on privacy. And they noted in their opinions that the court's decision left open several important questions about location privacy in the digital age, such as what kind of privacy interests individuals have in location information that's generated by a uh, cell phone and obtained by law enforcement from a wireless provider or from a mobile app provider, for instance. Um, Justice Alito suggested in his concurring opinion that Congress act to fill the gaps, and indeed it has, and we just heard from Congressman Chaffetz about the GPS Act, the Geolocation Privacy and Surveillance Act that he has introduced uh, in the House. Um, and I should note as well that that, that bill is co-sponsored by House Judiciary Committee Chairman Goodlatte, who's also a co-chair of the Internet Caucus. Um, and a companion bill has been introduced in the Senate by Senators Kirk, uh, Senators Wyden and Kirk. Um, just to provide a bit of background on what this bill would do and then kick off the conversation, um, these bills would make it unlawful for any person, as, as, uh, as Tim Lorden mentioned, um, any commercial entity, any individual or any law enforcement entity um, to intercept, use or disclose geolocation information unless one of the exceptions to the bill applied. And I just want to touch briefly on the definition of geolocation information in the bill because it's quite broad. Uh, it covers any information concerning the location of a wireless communication device, such as a cell phone or a tracking device that is generated by or derived from the operation of that device and could be used to determine or infer information regarding the location of a person. So either used to either determine the location or infer the location of a person. That's, that's quite broad. Um, and of course, several, uh, several exceptions apply in the commercial context. Prior express consent is enough to allow a commercial entity to uh, intercept and use that information. And in the law enforcement context, there are exceptions when law enforcement has a warrant or in certain national security cases and in certain emergencies. But I uh, would love to hear from the panel 
about what they think about this legislation and, and whether they think those exceptions um, provide the right balance of protection um, while still allowing the use of that information for legitimate purposes. Um, I think I'll start by asking Jason, um, going back to the definition of geolocation information in the bill, um, to explain the different types of geolocation information that uh, law enforcement and commercial entities might be able to intercept and use and the different legal standards that currently apply to those different types of information. Sure. Um, thank you, Nancy. Um, and I'm sorry, if you want to give your presentation before answering that question, that's... Sure. <laughs> well, let me just make a, a couple of remarks before I answer that question. Um, I was at DOJ, as Nancy said, for, for 15 years, and I prosecuted during that time just about every type of crime imaginable um, with a particular emphasis on violent crimes um, and more recently cyber crimes. I prosecuted more murder cases and gang cases and other cases against violent actors than I can count where uh, cell phone location information actually turned out to be critical to solving the crime or having solved the crime to actually proving it in court. I I've been in private practice for three and a half days. Um, <laughs> but I'm going to try as much as I can to give you the perspective not just of someone with a law enforcement background but of someone who's now in a position uh, of representing providers as well. Um, and I can tell you as a general matter whether I'm wearing my very large law enforcement hat and my very recently acquired providers lawyer hat, um, clear rules are needed and clear rules are good for everybody. At the end of the day, uh, everybody benefits from clear rules of the road. They're good for law enforcement, they're good for consumers, they're good for providers in, in their own dealings with law enforcement, uh, and they're good in, when, when those rules govern the relationship between uh, users and providers, not just between citizens and law enforcement and citizens and their government, but between users and providers. Um, and that kind of clarity is best provided, I think, by Congress and not by the courts. In the Jones case, Justice Alito recognized that the kind of line drawing that we need to have here is really best done in a comprehensive and thoughtful way by the legislative branch and not by, by courts. And in fact, if you look at the development of case law that I'll get to in a moment regarding cell site information, you'll see that it's a bit of a mess. And so this kind of uh, judicial uh, legal development is not helpful to anybody. Um, but having clear rules does not mean having only one rule. Um, not all types of location information are created equal, as I'll explain in a moment, and they should not all be treated equal. Um, there is a difference between historical and perspective information. There's a difference between information that is gathered in a time-limited period and information that is obtained from monitoring someone 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, and our privacy laws operate, and they always have operated, in a continuum. The lesser the intrusion, the lower the standard of proof the government needs to get uh, an investigative technique approved. The greater the intrusion, the greater the burden of proof the government has to meet. Um, you can stop and frisk someone uh, if, you, if you have reasonable suspicion that they are armed and are engaged in criminal conduct. If you want to arrest someone or search them, you need probable cause. Uh, if you want to obtain basic telephone subscriber information or records of who a person has called, what phone numbers a person has dialed, you need a subpoena, which simply requires relevance to a criminal investigation. If you want to listen to the calls, wiretap the person, you need a wiretap order, which requires probable cause and then some. So consistent with that continuum, we have always operated under a, a system where um, law enforcement has the tools it needs using less intrusive techniques to develop the evidence needed to achieve probable cause. So the phrase that we often use is building blocks. Um, law enforcement officers don't start their investigations with probable cause, they just don't. They start with a suspicion that a person is engaged in a crime and then they set out to try to prove it. And the way they set out to try to prove it is by using lower level investigative techniques that they can obtain using lower burdens of proof to try to build the evidence necessary to get over the threshold for probable cause, whether that's to do a wiretap, to do a search warrant, or to ultimately make an arrest. So while there are a lot of things about the GPS Act that I think are good, and, and all, of, all of them are well-intentioned, um, truly protecting privacy requires not only that uh, law enforcement has to use lawful process to get information, and that they have to follow clear and appropriate rules, but truly protecting your privacy means that law enforcement still needs to be able to get the information it needs to solve crimes and to get criminals off the street who are threatening you or threatening your privacy. So clear rules are great. Uh, a one-size-fits-all rule is not so great. Uh, it's not great for law enforcement, and ultimately, I would suggest it's not great for the safety of the public. So to, to Nancy's question, and, and uh, this will explain the building blocks point in a little more detail, um, there are uh, significant distinctions between the different types of location information that law enforcement can obtain, um, and, and that's true even within the realm of, of cell phones. Um, under current law, the evidentiary standard the government needs to meet 
depends on the type of cell phone location information the government is seeking. Um, as you may know, whenever you place a phone call, whenever you send a text message, your phone, in the ordinary course of business, sends a message, a signal to the tower that is closest to you, often the one that's closest to you, um, so that th that tower can make a record of where you are and can complete the text message or complete the transmission of the call. Um, your cell phone provider has this network of towers, and your cell phone provider maintains records of, of what cell towers your phone is hitting off of in the ordinary course of its business. And it does that so that it can complete calls for you, send text messages for you, and provide you with cellular service. Those cell towers uh, vary. In an urban area, they are more dense, and so they cover smaller geographic areas per tower. In a more rural area, they are uh, more sparse, and they, cover, they could cover areas of, of a number of miles. Cell tower information, when we seek it and when we get it from providers, is not nearly as precise as GPS, as it's commonly understood. Cell tower information tells you only the physical location of the cellular antenna that is serving your call, your phone, during a phone call or during a text message. Um, that varies widely. If you're in New York City, it's going to be a more precise area. If you're in Des Moines, Iowa, it's going to be less precise. And depending on call volume, the tower that's serving your call might not even be the tower closest to you. Uh, so it is anything but a precise uh, identification of your location. It cannot place you within a house. It cannot place you within this room. Um, and it often can only place you within uh, you know, a few hundred meters or, or even as much as a mile or two. Now, there are two types of cell tower information. There's historical, which is what cell tower was your phone hitting off of on January 3rd, 2013 at 1 o'clock when you made a phone call. And there's perspective, which is what cell towers are you going to be hitting off of in the next 30 days. For historical cell tower information, Generally, uh, there is general uniformity in the courts that the government has to meet a standard known as specific and articulable facts. That's sort of a, a, a equivalent to reasonable suspicion. Um, and they have to obtain what's called a 2703D order named for the, the statute that gave it life. Um, some courts require more. Some courts have held that that's a floor and not the actual standard. And, and that's something that the department's trying to fix. But generally, the standard is reasonable suspicion or its equivalent to get historical cell tower records. Now, to get prospective cell tower records, there's a split that's developed among courts in the country. And this is why I say that Congress needs to step in and not leave it to the courts to, to clarify the law here. Many districts have historically used what's called a hybrid order. It's a combination of a 2703D order and a pen register. Um, so the standard is effectively reasonable suspicion, specific and articulable facts. But starting in about 2005, uh, a, a wave of magistrate opinions spread throughout the country in which magistrates decided that the statutory authority for prospective cell tower information was lacking in 2703D and the pen register statute. And then in the absence of clarification from Congress and statutory authority from Congress that was clear, they were going to require a search warrant. They were going to require a showing of probable cause to get prospective cell tower information. And so in those districts where the magistrates have adopted that view, you need probable cause to get cell tower information prospectively. And in those districts where they have not, bless you, uh, reasonable suspicion is enough. I practiced as an AUSA in Baltimore for many years, and I was there at the moment when Baltimore changed from a reasonable suspicion district to a probable cause district, and we could talk about some of the consequences that had for, for significant investigations in a moment. But that's cell tower. GPS is a different matter entirely. Um, GPS is precise. It is not maintained typically by the provider in its ordinary course of business. It's, made, it's provided to the government at the government's request. Um, and it has been, as long as I can remember, and I've been a, I was a prosecutor back to 1999, as long as I can remember, uh, at least during the period that people have actually been using cell phones, um, the department's uh, rule for obtaining GPS information from a cell phone has been to get a search warrant. And that would be a surprise to any of you who watch 24 or pretty much any cop show that's ever been on CBS. But that's, that's true. You don't just, if you're Jack Barry, you don't just punch up on your Blackberry and get your GPS information from someone's phone. You need a warrant. Uh, and there's a number of reasons for that. As I said, it's not collected in the ordinary course of business. It's done at the request of law enforcement. It's more precise, which means it's more likely to yield information about you in a private location where you've got a reasonable expectation of privacy. And the provider might need to actually ping the phone to get the information from the GPS chip in the phone, which is an intrusion into your privacy interest in the phone. So for all those reasons, the department requires a search warrant or some other order based on probable cause to get GPS information. The law is a little more complicated on tracking devices, but I think I'm, I don't want to go there if we don't need to go there, but I'm happy to. But, but I think it's important to understand those distinctions, and then I can explain a little later why the cell tower information is one of those building blocks I mentioned, and why you need it to get up to the point where you can get probable cause to do, uh, to use more intrusive techniques or ultimately to, to prosecute your case. Yes. Do you want to go ahead? 
give an opening scene. Sure. Good afternoon, I'm Stephanie Pell, and I too was a federal prosecutor for several years before coming onto the Hill and beginning to work during the 111th Congress on ECPA reform, which included uh, looking at law enforcement access to location data. Um, and so let me start basically by responding to Jason's comments, because I, I, I think a lot of what he said I would agree with, that we all near, need clear rules, that the current legal landscape um, regarding law enforcement access to prospective and now even historical records um, is extremely chaotic. And you have magistrate judges even in the same district who are uh, authorizing law enforcement collection of lo location data under different standards. And, and that's not good for any of the major stakeholders, privacy, equities, law enforcement, or industry. Here's where I'm going to differ a little bit, and, and I, I, I find this a very interesting point. Um, Jason has drawn a really firm line in the sand about precision of GPS data and cell site location data. And let me first say that I'm not a technologist. Um, I rely on technologist friends um, to explain this to me. But the way that I understand it now is that because, especially in urban areas, um, our need and use of our cell phones and our, our requirement that carriers send all of our emails and our text messages and our calls um, has become um, so necessary that cell towers sometimes can't handle all of the traffic. So in order for carriers to provide you with uh, good service, they have, uh, they are now in deploying some technology called microcells, femtocells, and picocells. And these small devices can be sent to you in the mail and you can put them in your home and they will serve as a little mini cell tower. And when your uh, phone connects with that microcell, it will generate location data, which will show that your phone is in that area, in your home. Um, Professor Matt Blaze, who had testified a couple weeks ago at a House Judiciary hearing um, on law enforcement access to cell phone location data, and had previously testified in the 111th Congress, has made the important point that trying to draft legislation that strictly is based on the relative precision of cell site location data versus GPS makes no sense. Why is that? Because we are only going to trend for cell site data to become more and more precise. And to the extent that we keep trying to draw a line in the sand, we're going to end up with legislation that is out of date a few years after it's passed if it wouldn't already be out of date. Now that is not to say, as, as Jason said, that a one size standard fits all is the, is the appropriate way to go either. Um, Congressman Bobby Scott at the location hearing a couple weeks ago said that a probable cause standard is the place to start the discussion. And while, while that may be a very reasonable place to start the discussion, I respectfully submit to you that that is not where the discussion needs to end. And, and that we can talk about how law enforcement uses perspective location information and historical location information in, in, in investigations to understand how we might make sure that law enforcement has a standard where it gets what it needs for its legitimate purposes, but at the same time doesn't get have unnecessary over collection. And, and I, I think that's the challenge for Congress in trying to draft appropriate standards. I also think that a total focus on standards is probably not the best way to address all the privacy concerns with location data. For example, let's say there is a uh, bank robbery that occurs and the, the robber or robbers um, were all wearing masks so nobody gets a good look at who they are. It is reasonable as a starting point in an investigation for law enforcement to want to learn all of the cell phones that were in the vicinity of the bank at the, appro at the appropriate time. Now, that is li likely means that you're going to get, of course, if, if the bank robbers had cell phones on them, you're going to get the information uh, that, that they were there. 
but you're also going to get a lot of innocent third-party data. So when, when we talk about making sure privacy interests are protected, we need to look at how law enforcement can appropriately minimize data when it's no longer relevant to an investigation. And we also need to think about appropriate reporting requirements to Congress so that as the years pass and as technology changes, Congress understands how law enforcement uses this information so it can better discern appropriate policy uh, directions to take. Believe it or not, back in 2000, the House Judiciary Committee was considering this very issue. Um, the bill didn't go anywhere, but one of the provisions of the bill what was reporting requirements about law enforcement <coughs> use of location data. Um, and I respectfully submit to you that here we are in 2013 with, I'm not saying we don't have any greater information, but a lot of it's been because of press stories, um, FOIA requests that civil liberties organizations have done. And we would be a lot better off in um, helping our policymakers understand technology, understand law enforcement uses, if not only we focused on standards, but some downstream privacy protections like minimization and reporting requirements. Hi, I'm Brian Chase. I'm uh, general counsel from Foursquare. And I, I have to say, I, I view, I live in a different world. Uh, I have not been a prosecutor. You'll probably be able to tell that from my presentation. Uh, but I, I view things from the, the business side. My, my, my career has been uh, focused on representing companies, startups in particular, and the concerns of startups of understanding what they can do, what they can't do. Um, you know, with respect to, with respect to the, the discussion at uh, that we're discussing right now, I, I have concerns with an approach uh, to address the, the government collection of data which, which somehow also combines with the commercialization of data, with the ability for companies to actually be successful, for companies to actually be able to provide those services to you for free to provide you the recommendations that you want instead of, for example, me receiving a recommendation for a style, a cut, and a color, uh, which is a true story, which I, I received at very not on point. Uh, so the, I, I feel like as, a, as, a, as an attorney for a startup and as, a, as an attorney for a, a company who, represents, who, for, who used to represent these people, I'm concerned about I'm so concerned about the, the premise that the only way that we're going to get clarity is from Congress. And while I, I do understand definitely the, that there are different, different wiretap acts and different uh, rules across the states that needs to be, uh, to be brought into line and we can ask Congress to do that, I think we should set apart the commercial side of things. I think that by not doing so, and one of the, the concerns I have with the GPS Act is that by using definitions that are too broad, that you can impact the commercialization, you can inter impact these, kind of, these companies that are trying to, to uh, do the right thing, but, uh, but notwithstanding these uh, exceptions, may not know what to do. Um, I also think of, of some of the companies, uh, you know, we talk about, you know, there's the discussion about whether the, the data is specific, whether it's the specific GPS or whether it's the, the cell towers. Well, in truth, the, the, the government officials are coming to companies, are coming to these startups and are asking for the location information that these startups have. Uh, most of these startups, if they're using mobile devices, are using it, the, the location from the phone. Uh, they, you know, that location is provided by whatever Android gives you, whatever iOS gives you. So the, the, the discussion on whether we say cell tower versus GPS, I think, you know, isn't, isn't appropriate. You know, right now we're talking about specific location. This is location that the phone tells you, it, you know, depending on what Apple says, it's either 100 meters to, uh, you know, a little bit more. But, you know, I know of companies that have been, that have hired, have hired attorneys whose full-time job is to respond to these requests because they know this data is gold. They know this data is precise. They know this data is time sensitive. And, and you know, that it put, it places a large burden on these individuals. So I guess in short, I, I do think, yes, some clarity for these companies would be nice, uh, but, but doing it in a way that doesn't you know, hurt, hurt companies which are actually, you know, moving forward our economy is necessary. Um, uh, Jason, do you want to respond to some of the ways that um, this bill might, what the consequences might be of not making that kind of a distinction between different types of location information could have on 
law enforcement some real world examples if you have any? Sure. And actually, before I do, just to just to pick up on something Brian said, I, I think that this is one of those rare debates where everybody has the same objective, but there's no one right way to get there. I mean, everybody cares about privacy. Nancy was a fabulous chief privacy officer at the Department of Justice, but um, every federal prosecutor has to be a privacy officer in his or her own case. Uh, they're citizens too, just like you. They take an oath to protect the Constitution. If they obtain evidence in a way that violates the Constitution, their their consequences for them personally and their cases get thrown out. Providers like Foursquare and Google and Microsoft and Facebook care about your privacy uh, just as you do, and not just because the FTC tells them to, but because their leaders and their employees and their lawyers are internet users who have their own privacy concerns as consumers, uh, and the companies want to earn the trust of their their users, not suspicion and anger. Um, and everybody cares about public safety and national security, and everybody wants a dynamic and free and thriving internet. Um, and so I think that the real question is, how do you draw these lines in a way that doesn't impact competitiveness, that, that doesn't negatively impact public safety, and that nevertheless protects privacy? So to Nancy's question, one of the reasons why I think that a one-size-fits-all approach could have a, a, a dramatic impact on, on public safety is, as I said before, law enforcement doesn't start with probable cause. Um, and I, can, I could probably spend an hour giving you examples of murder cases or, or uh, other cases involving violent crime and violent criminals uh, where um, cell site information was a critical building block to get law enforcement to probable cause so that they, they, they could get a search warrant to search the home and find the, the murder weapon and, and find the, the person who committed the crime. Or where it was necessary actually to rule out a suspect, that there was an armed robbery at a commercial establishment and we got a whole bunch of cell phones that were in that area and needed location information to try to figure out uh, which individuals truly were in the area and which ones were, were not. So self-site information is often important to weed out innocent people and, and to uh, remove them from suspicion. But uh, it, is, it is often the case, that, and it will be the case, that if there is a one-size-fits-all standard and the only way to get any location information of any kind, of any specificity, regardless of whether it was from three years ago or three months from now, um, is to get a, a warrant for probable cause, there will be very serious crimes, not just electronic crimes, and not that those aren't serious, but crimes that threaten people's personal safety that will, and, and, and the safety of, of their children that will not be able to get solved because the evidence won't be there to get law enforcement over the hurdle to get the search warrant for the home that is the, where, the, where the evidence is, or to get the wiretap that's needed to get the content that will help uh, establish that the person's guilty of the crime. And, uh, and so that's why I say that, that you know, we need to continue to have a system here, just as we have for decades, uh, of a continuum where the greater the intrusion, the greater the burden of proof. And, and Stephanie makes a very good point that it's not just about the standards you write. Um, it's also about the way those standards are applied. Um, uh, the New York Times did a great report last year or two years ago that suggests that ECPA standards, the standards that govern access to, uh, to content uh, information and metadata about electronic communications are not applied consistently between the local and state court systems and the federal system. Um, the Electronic Communications Privacy Act is supposed to be the law of the land, not the law for federal prosecutors. There's like a soccer game going on over there. Mm -hmm. um, but it's supposed to be the law that applies to the New York City Police Department, the Baltimore Police Department, and the, the FBI. Um, but it's not. Uh, in practice, there are local police departments that are sort of subverting the requirements of the statute and getting location information or content information without adhering to the, to the strictures of federal law. The, the first time I ever had a Baltimore cop come up to me with uh, what they call in the parlance pinging data, GPS data from a cell phone that I didn't authorize him to go get. Um, I, and I asked him to show me the order that the judge signed and the, and the application for the order. It, in words, it was shorter than the answer I'm giving now, much shorter. And, uh, and it had nothing, if, even within a mile of probable cause. And we then undertook to stop the police department from doing that, but that's happening in police departments all over the country. So whatever the standards are, whether they're changed or whether they're increased or decreased or they stay the same, one thing Congress could do, and this is something the GPS Act, I think, tries to do, is to make clear that the standards that apply to the federal system apply to all law enforcement systems because they have to be applied uniformly. And even within the federal system, Stephanie is right, within the same courthouses, certain courthouses in this country, you could walk down the hall and have one magistrate require probable cause for location data and one require reasonable suspicion. There's, that's not fair to law enforcement, but it's, it's not fair to citizens either. You know, there's no justice when the law is applied differently to different people, even within the same federal system and even within the same federal courthouse. So I think that, that um, uh, the consequences of having a one-size-fits-all system is that cases can't get built in, in many critical ways, uh, and that there will be lots, lots of crimes that, get un that go unsolved, and there will be a negative consequence for public safety. Um, and so I think that standards should be clear, 
but there should be a continuum as, as there is in so many other areas of law enforcement. And, and most importantly, the standards have to be applied by judges in a rigorous way. Uh, just one other example. I was in AUSA in the Southern District of New York before I came to Baltimore. In the Southern District of New York, if you want a pen register, which is a pro prospective list of, of who's calling you, what phone numbers are calling you, what phone numbers you're calling, you pretty much, you could put it on a postcard. You, you, print, you just have to certify to the judge that the information is relevant material to a criminal investigation, you will get your pen register. That's all the statute requires, by the way. In Baltimore, you have to write a PhD dissertation. Um, you have to write 15, 20 single-spaced pages of facts, uh, laying out all of the evidence in your case. And I have submitted those and had them returned to me for, for being insufficient. Same standard, but being applied very differently, one more rigorously, one less rigorously, by federal magistrates in the United States in the same period of time. So I think that we need to make sure that our, our, our magistrates and our district judges apply the standards rigorously, whatever they are, and apply them consistently. Thanks. Um, and then I'm, I'm going to ask a question of each of our remaining panelists, and then I wanted to leave time for questions from the audience. So um, if I could ask Stephanie you sort of a conceptual question. Um, just uh, briefly, if you could uh, talk about the uh, privacy as, as conceptually and um, looking at what this bill does, this bill requires law enforcement to get a warrant to obtain location information from Foursquare, for instance, which has already obtained consent from the individual to collect and disclose uh, information about that person's location. So I think what the, the bill does through legislation is uh, eliminate the effect of the third party doctrine by allowing people to have more control over with whom they share their information and for what purpose. And if you could just briefly discuss as a conceptual level uh, about privacy, the, it, not being a binary concept between disclosure and non-disclosure, but something a little bit broader than that. Sure, um, and if I can, I'll uh, sort of ground that in, in a third party yeah. discussion. Um, I, I think one of the interesting things, although I don't know how, I, I'm guessing it's gonna take a long time to have traction, is Justice Sotomayor in the Jones opinion, um, or her Jones opinion, basically said that perhaps the third party doctrine has outlived its use in the digital age. That in a digital age, when we are constantly giving information to third parties for one specific purpose, perhaps we don't waive our privacy rights um, insofar as just because I'm sharing with Foursquare doesn't mean that I willy nilly am saying Foursquare can share with the government. Um, just w when we say third party doctrine, um, it, it's a, a concept that comes out of two cases, the Smith and the Miller case. One was telephone toll records case, one was a bank record case, which basically says when you share information with a third party, you give up your uh, privacy rights, so to speak. And um, now, of course, the law, Congress has come in over time to try to rebalance um, in, more in the favor of privacy. When the Electronic Communications Privacy Act was first passed in 1986, that was an attempt to rebalance. Um, the Right to Financial Privacy Act is, is another statute that does that. What we are seeing now, in, now, though, is as we are kind of stretching the bounds of ECPA and there are all sorts of um, providers who may not have fallen under ECPA's definition, because let's face it, ECPA was a statute passed in 1986 when cell phones were the size of small kitchen appliances. We can appreciate that as new technologies and, and our, our reliance on third parties to store everything about our lives in the hands of, of someone else, so to speak, that that really conceptual, conceptually stretches the notion um, Am I really wanting Foursquare to share my location? Am I really giving consent to them to share it with everyone? Or, or are there some limitations? So the, G, the GPS Act is trying to bring kind of those expectations back into balance, if that sort of gets it. Yes, thank you. Um, and Brian, I wanted to ask you uh, generally if you could talk about the ways in which individuals use uh, location-based services, um, and the ways in which companies are seeking to lo use location information to provide new services, if you have any insight into that in the yeah. startup community. Yeah, so one thing that's interesting with location, and, and um, 
Jason mentioned this, that there's different types of location, but there's also in the, this context of location-based services and location on, on, on phones, there's, there's also a, an, an additional type. So you have the location that, that your device receives, so the location that is reported by whatever location services uh, API that the device provides. But then there's also these services like Facebook, Foursquare, um, Yelp, the, the check-in service, I guess you could say, where you can actually voluntarily say where you are. Uh, and there is no obligation that says that if, I, if my mobile device says that I am across the street, that I can't say that I'm here at, you know, at, at, at Sewell and Belmont. Uh, so there's a question whether, also in, in a way, whether one of those is content and one of those is location. Uh, you know, there's, there's always been a discussion with respect to warrants and subpoenas whether content, you know, what level content falls under. And it, you know, currently, uh, you know, the, the, the understanding is, well, that would fall under the warrant. So does that mean that, that for me, you know, as, as a provider, or as, a, as a, a company with a provider, that I have two standards with respect to data, where I can share this data with you under a subpoena standard or, uh, or a court order, but then this data, well, it's content, so now it goes under a... Um, uh, it, you know, it goes under the warrant. Um, but, I mean, location is becoming a big thing. So location, one, you know, the, uh, a lot of the recommendation services, almost actually all the recommendation services that you have on phones, you know, you have Google Now, you have Foursquare, you have Yelp, use your location to give you an idea of where you want to go to eat. When you, when you are identified in a location here in D.C., it's not going to recommend to you a restaurant in New York City. Uh, you know, but then there's also other applications like Maps. You know, if you didn't give your location to Maps, then you know, how would you use a map? Uh, another application that uses a lot of, uh, of location data is, you know, the, is the Weather Channel app, which, you know, do, do you want your location here or there? Do you, when you open the app, do you want to have to put in your exact address for it to then give it to you, or do you just want to turn on and, and tell you the app? But then with these, you know, are you paying for them? You know, how do they get paid for? And so, you know, companies, mobile devices are, are having a difficult time finding a monetization strategy. Uh, you, you know, the, the, the big news with Facebook of the last quarter was, hey, it looks like we're figuring it out. Uh, you know, that's, that, so maybe they're getting it. Uh, you know, right now, monetization, it, you know, we, we've lived in this world for so long where we've had all these services for free based on the information that we provide from the web we're used to it. And now we're in this mobile ecosystem where the providers need to find a way. And, and so now they're trying to find, you know, through anonymous ways to use location to, to, you know, to provide, you know, some sort of, you know, to receive some sort of monetization, whether it be advertising, well, primarily advertisement seems to be the way to go right now. But, you know, I, I can just see things happening going forward. And, and you know, the industry has, has, I think, done a pretty good job on its own on, on coming up with ways to let users know. I mean, Foursquare has always been what we refer to as a double opt-in. You know, you, well, I guess it's triple because you, you have the platform asking if you can use your location. And then if you're going to share your location, you have to check a location and check in. Uh, so there, and, then, and as I said, there's these apps that are definitely location-based. But then there's, on the flip side, there's going to be applications that, that see this just as a, a way of making money, uh, which don't make sense. I mean, I, I, my daughter downloaded a, a game, a makeup game for, on, on, uh, on her iPhone, on her iPod, and it asked for her location. I have no idea why that would need her location. So it, it was definitely a hot topic, but um, I, I do think that location is something that consumers are getting used to. Um, you know, it's it's not. Uh, people are used to the concept of their location being shared. I do like um, this discussion about whether, when they give consent to Foursquare, whether that means well, we acknowledge that the government can come to you for my data. Um, but uh, I, I do think it's going to be a topic for years to come. Great, thank you. Um, questions from the audience, Chris. Yeah. So if the government gets a wiretap for your telephone after the conclusion of the investigation, you will eventually be told. It may, it may take a while, the government can delay the notification if it, if it would endanger anyone, but eventually you will be told. But if the government gets your location information, you will never be told. And we actually sort of have this strangely perverse situation right now, which is if you are charged with a crime, you will learn probably through discovery that the government obtained your location information, but if you're innocent of any crime and you're never charged with anything, you will never learn that the government obtained your location information. Do you think, Jason and anyone else on the panel who wants to take a stab at this, do you think this is a reasonable standard to have, or, or should we get notice at some point down the road, not during the investigation, not to tip off the bad guys, mm -hmm. but at some point down the road, should you learn that the government obtained either historical or real-time data about your movements? Well, as you said, if, you, if, you're, if you're a suspect in a crime, you're going to find out 
in a most unfortunate and probably unpleasant way because you're going to be arrested and you'll find out in the course of your prosecution. If, you're, um, if your location is obtained and you're turned out to be a witness to a crime or you're not involved in the crime at all, um, look, I, I, think that, I think that that's a fair point. I think that there's no harm, provided that there's the ability to delay just like you do with a wiretap to protect the integrity of an ongoing investigation. I don't think there's any harm in that kind of notification being made because it, just to, to add to your point, it's not just the person who's the target of the wiretap who gets notified. It's anyone who's intercepted on the phone. So one of the one of the administrative challenges when you conclude a wiretap and you reach the point where you have to make those notifications is you have to go through every single phone number for every single person who was intercepted, find a good address for them, and send them a notice that they were intercepted at some point during a wiretap, even if it wasn't their phone. So I think that it's it's entirely reasonable as long as, again, there's provisions for delay that mirror those in the wiretap statute for that kind of notification to be made. Yes. My question is about foreign citizens. Obviously, that's a big question about tracking, and I don't know if I'm not trying to get your domain uh, exactly, but what is the provision for making the differentiation for a foreign citizen perhaps being tracked by outside the United States when they come here to have this data available? So, so is, it, is the question of foreign citizens who are tracked in the United States? Oh, okay. Does anybody want to take that up? The provide if you are going to a U.S. provider, my understanding is they're not looking to determine if the if the foreign if you have a foreign customer or a U.S. customer. If the U.S. company has the data, they have to comply with the law. Now. The law is kind of confusing right now, so that, and that's the, we've been having that discussion. But I'm not a, I, in my background, I've never seen in a normal criminal case that kind of distinction. Yeah, you know, the, right. At the time that you're seeking the order for the person's location information, the provider may, wouldn't even necessarily know where you are. And certainly you, if the person travels outside the United States, you don't know that at the time that the order is is uh, is executed. So right, as long as the provider is subject to our laws and is in possession of the data, then the provider has to comply with the legal process, whatever that is. I guess I was more directing at which law enforcement agency is going to collect the data, right? Because whether it's NSA or whoever, when they're following. NSA is looking at the law enforcement agency. They're an intelligence agency. No, and I know that's my question is whether within the border that will change somehow. Well, the provider is going to collect the data, and the provider is going to provide it to the law enforcement agency that served the order. So it would be a domestic U.S. law enforcement agency that served the order. Um, the, the, the law enforcement agency in the U.S. doesn't get the data directly. They get it from the provider. It's also worth, worth noting that, that these kind of, just to put this in perspective, um, um, one of the ironies of this whole debate is that we, we spend a lot of time focusing on privacy vis-a-vis -vis law enforcement, and law enforcement orders seeking location data or cell phone use data or internet use data affect an extraordinarily small percentage of users nationwide or worldwide. You know, Microsoft's law enforcement compliance report from 2012 reflects that law enforcement requests at every level of the United States, state, local, and federal, um, related to 0.02% of all users of Microsoft services. Google's report reflects uh, that law enforcement requests governed about, affected about 0.0058% of Google users. Now, the, the numbers for cell phone users are, are somewhot higher because cell phones are so pervasive, but 100% um, of mobile device users, when they buy an app and, you know, or their, their daughter buys an app and uh, have to worry that that app is going to be requesting or utilizing the location services, um, but very small percentage of, of the population and only those who are suspects in crimes need to worry about uh, law enforcement tracking them. Now, if you are a suspect in a crime, you should tell me afterwards because I'm looking for clients. But, but if you're not, uh, it's not something that, that, um, that is going to affect your, your life. The, the flip side, though, is that whereas legislation is really ne necessary to clean up these standards, this confusion about the standards for law enforcement, I, I think Brian's right. It's not at all clear that legislation is necessary to, to address the privacy relationship between consumers and their providers because it's now become a, mar a, 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 a market force. Um, you find Google competing with Facebook and Facebook competing with Microsoft and Microsoft competing with Google over which one is more protective of your privacy. So um, there's a cachet to being protective of consumer privacy. And, and uh, you know, the market, the market will, will uh, act as a corrective force there. I mean, the fact is there's poll numbers that show that a very high percentage of Americans don't want to be tracked on the Internet. But a very similar high percentage of Americans in other polls show that they want location-based services that are helpful to them. They want Foursquare. They want maps. They want the things that Brian mentioned. 
they want advertising that's relevant to them. They want to know when there's a Starbucks around the corner, although I don't know what corner you could be on where there's not a Starbucks around the corner. <laughs> um, but they want internet services to be free and useful and, and, and relevant to them. And that only comes from a certain degree of tracking. So I think that, that in, the, in the consumer space, which affects everybody, um, we need to allow time for the market forces to sort of bring us to a place where uh, providers are more protective. But in the law enforcement space, which affects almost a, a very small percentage of the population, we need some clarity. I just say that the statistics that Jason just quoted were voluntary disclosures by two <laughs> companies. Kudos to those companies, yes, yes. but the law doesn't require that kind of disclosure so that when Congress sits down to figure this out, it's like pulling teeth to get it. So perhaps one, one uh, point that law enforcement, maybe even companies could agree to, is some reasonable reporting requirements to kind of track trends along the way. You, you also could require that from the judges. You, know, you made the point about wiretaps. It's a, also a provision in the Wiretap Act that every time a, a wiretap is completed or a wiretap order is signed, the judge has to fill out a piece of paper, a form, and send it to the administrative office of the courts, which is not far from here. And they compile that for every single federal judge in the United States every year. And they report to Congress on how often wiretaps are issued in each district in the country. And those same judges who sign pen registers and D orders and orders for location information could fill out a form that's tailored for that purpose too, submit it to the administrative office and they could provide it to Congress and that would give Congress a greater window on how these various techniques are being used. And I would just add to that too, because there, there's no exclusionary rule in ECPA generally, just moving away even from location information, a lot of requests for stored communications uh, are left sealed and, and we don't have information about the degree to which requests are made for, for that kind of information either. So we have time for one more question, if anybody has another question. If not, please thank the panelists. Thank you. And thank you to the audience.